everyone. Um, I'd like to start us a few minutes early because our speaker, Bob Bachman, says he's got lots and lots of stuff to show us and he wants plenty of time to do it, but he also wants plenty of time to offer everybody time to ans get answers to their questions. So at the end of this session, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, so keep them and think about them, and Bob is happy to answer them. Um, just very quickly, my name's Sharon Washburn, and I am a local architect. I do a lot of residential work. So this is of particular interest to me, but I've also been on the Montgomery County Historical Society board for many years, and I am now active in the Center for Suburban Studies, which is the sponsor for this program, and is the group that Bob is in charge of and has been in charge of for the past five years or so. Yeah. Um, Bob is a very modest man. I asked him for a little write-up he sent me two tiny paragraphs. And of course, he forgot to say, you know, gosh, he was in the healthcare field running organizations for many years. But at the, after that point, having done an MA in American Studies at George Washington University many years ago, I won't give him his, too much time on that, but his thesis was Tacoma Park, Maryland, 1883-1942, a case study of a railroad suburb. He was interested in suburbanization 40 years ago, back when the rest of us were just thinking, ah, suburbs, eh, you know. Um, and then when the Historical Society made a Center for Suburban Studies, Bob's hand went up. Um, he was also, though, at that time, on the board, and he's been secretary, vice president, president, and I think he was both president and the head of Subur Center for Suburban Studies at the same time. So like I said, he is a modest man. Um, I do want you to know, last year Bob gave a talk on the growth of Montgomery County in the 1950s, so this is a follow-up on that. But last year's talk is now an online program on the Montgomery County website. So if you're interested in the topic, you can get more information by going back to the Historical Society website and finding out more about what's going on. So, um, Bob Bachman, welcome and thanks for doing this for us. Thank you, Sharon. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being in the room today. Uh, I, I, I'm excited that you're interested in this topic, and um, we have a lot to talk about, so uh, let's get started. Please hold your questions till the end, uh, because if you ask me a question in the middle, I'll get so distracted uh, we won't finish on time. But please hold your questions to the end, and I'm very interested in them. Yeah, because, you know, if there are people out there who don't have a handout who want one, there's a few extra up here and on the chairs here. So you want handouts back there if you're missing them? Okay. Well, let's go. Uh, my topic, as Sharon mentioned, is the 1950s housing boom in Montgomery County. Uh, I'm dividing it into three parts. I'm going to give the national perspective on uh, the uh, housing, um, the county perspective on the, the housing boom, and then I'm going to talk specifically about how the boom uh, unfolded in the county. Uh, on August 14, 1945, Harry Truman interrupted evening radio programming nationwide to make an announcement. Uh, which of the following do you think he announced? You're right. Uh, Harry Truman announced the, the Japanese had surrendered and World, World, World War II was over, but he could have announced that the nation was going to embark on a housing boom. Uh, he had all, all the pieces were in place, um, and um, that's exactly what happened as soon as this surrender occurred. <clears throat> um, there was a national housing shortage in the nation. Um, uh, we had um, the, the Depression, followed by the war, had restricted construction in the United States, we had six million families that were doubled up, tripled up, maybe quadrupled up with their own families or friends. 
Another half a million were in temporary quarters like Quonset huts. And right after the war, there even were Quonset hut villages along Sligo Creek. Uh, one was over at the Columbia Union College in Tacoma Park where the Adventist College. One was right in Tacoma Park near um, Colesville Road and one was up in Linden. Uh, and these were soldiers whose incomes were so low uh, that they, the county provided um, uh, temporary housing for them. And at that time, less than half of all Americans owned a home. There was an idea in the country that the returning veterans, uh, have, having made so many sacrifices, uh, really deserved to be able to buy a home uh, and start a family when they returned to the United States. Uh, here's, an ad from G oh, here's an ad that GE placed in a magazine in which they were saying, more than that, it's a promise, uh, partly because they had all these products on the bottom row here that could be used in um, vacuum cleaners and uh, washing machines and refrigerators and cabinetry and all these electronic contraptions that they were willing, hoping to sell. Um, <clears throat> Congress had passed important bills um, to stimulate home construction. In 1934, in the midst of the Depression, uh, a third of the unemployment in the country was related to construction. A third of those people without a work had construction skills. And this, the National Housing Act created the Federal Housing Administration to spur construction. It really didn't work very well, uh, but it was in place and ready to, be, to, to work. In 44, when the U.S. knew they were going to win the war, they passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, which was fortunately reduced to GI Bill, and that created a special mortgage program for veterans within the Veterans Administration. However, those mortgages were going to follow uh, exactly the existing FHA procedures and policies. Now, this is a busy slide here, but the FHA uh, housing program and the VA, uh, FHA mortgage program and loan program and the VA uh, loan program revolutioned, revolutionized home finance in the United States. <clears throat> it did a, not, a couple of things really well. They ensured construction loans to builders, so builders were not putting all their money up front and taking the big risks, which made them much more willing to move quickly to get involved in building houses. They ensured the loans to home buyers. Uh, mortgage lenders were now allowed to loan 93% of the property value. Prior to World War II, uh, people put down maybe uh, that you could get a loan for 58% of the value and you had to put up uh, 30% and then you had to get a bridge loan, a second mortgage to kind of make the whole thing come, fall together. Uh, home buyers were able to put down less than 10%. In some cases, GIs put down 0%. Um, and they also extended the, the, hit, the uh, payment period for mortgages from previously 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 15 years, it moved into 20 and, 20 and 30 years. At that point, a mortgage payment could be less than the rent that a returning serviceman or a worker in the, in the Washington area would be paying for an apartment. It made home buying very, very uh, attractive. Uh, the FH, FHA established minimal national standards for home construction, and they enforced those by on-site inspections. And it didn't take very long for an FHA-inspected home to have the confidence of buyers that it was going to be free of gross structural or, or uh, mechanical uh, defects. So the FHA was a, a gold star for home buyers. And this was the minimum house design that the FHA, and this is in the 30s they proposed this, but it, it really influenced the first houses built between 45 and 50 and in the first five years of the 50s. 624 square feet, that's your home. You get four rooms, living room, eat-in kitchen, two bedrooms, one full bathroom. Central heating would be in the basement, or if you didn't have a basement, if you're on a slab, it would be in your kitchen. Uh, there'd be a washing machine in the kitchen or the basement. No front porches, no side porches. Privacy was being created by the, your, in your backyard. That was your outdoor living space. The FHA and VA loans <clears throat> had a downside, and the downside was significant in U.S. history. They facilitated racial segregation in the, in the emerging suburbs uh, after World War II. Um, the insurance, uh, FHA insurance, was entirely focused on single home uh, construction on the edges of cities. They ignored the core cities. They had a loan program to, they did have a loan program to help people repair existing structures. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't have a lot of money for it, and the terms for the repayment of those loans was very short. So it was very hard for people to get loans to keep their inner city houses or city houses up to date. Um, the FHA had a specific concern about inharmonious racial or nationality groups. 
They wanted homogeneity in these in where houses were being built. They felt that would prevent decline of the value of the home. Now remember, they were providing loans. They were guaranteeing loans. They wanted to have the feeling that those loans um, would be paid back because there'd be stability. Uh, but, and they also, in their underwriting manual, and this is surprising to me, they recommended that, that there be sort of specific subdivision regulations and suitable restrictive covenants. Well, restrictive covenants had already been used prior to World War II uh, to prevent uh, uh, people of Jewish faith, uh, Catholic faith, and uh, African Americans from buying single family homes in the United States. So the idea that FHA was encouraging covenants was almost as if they were encouraging a continuation of discrimination in housing. Uh, they may not have intended it to be that, but that's what it emerged to be. And even though the Supreme Court in 48 ruled that these covenants were unenforceable, and contrary to public policy, the mindset was set, and it influenced uh, behavior uh, in the sale of houses for um, uh, at least a, well, decades, at least a decade after that. Um, <clears throat> this FHA loan program to builders, it was an unparalleled business opportunity for the men and, and, and women who were involved in home building. And a guy named uh, John Keats wrote a book in the 50s called The Crack in the Picture Window, kind of pointing out the flaws of the perfect world that was created post-war. And I really like this quote. The real estate boys read the bill, looked at one another in happy amazement, and the dry, rasping noise they made rubbing their hands together could be heard as far away as Tawi Tawi. I mean, he, it just doesn't get any better than that. Tawi Tawi is a little island uh, uh, in, in the Philippines. Um, and or, that we were, we were involved in in the war. But um, it was a great opportunity for builders. And in addition to that, all the technology that had, that had produced war products, much of it could be applied to the production of homes post-war. Uh, High-speed machines could produce windows, framing, stairs, cabinets, uh, plywood, wallboard, um, composition board. So here's, this is a, um, oh, sorry. This is Levittown, Long Island. You got nine guys here, maybe eight. It's on this concrete slab. Today's Saturday. Monday, house is, house is completely framed. There's a roof on it, doors are on it, and they're working on that third day to build the inside out, to finish the inside of the house. Two days, put the walls up, put the roof up, uh, everything. Um, that's what the, uh, uh, the, this technology made possible. And right here, this is the house. It just hasn't been put together yet. So the combination of that technology, and particularly the FHA loans, housing uh, starts took off in the United States. We had 114,000 in 1944. Six years later, 1.7 million houses were started. I mean, it was a rocket. Um, and that was the highest number of house starts in, the, in, the, in U.S. history by 1950. Now let's talk about Montgomery County. The first slide you, that I had up here of the county, you may have noticed there are five election districts. But in 1950, there were 13 election districts in the county. And uh, I'm going to be talking principally about four, seven, 13, and, and uh, six, or five. There were a number of factors in Montgomery County that made it ready to respond quickly to the house, needs of, uh, to build houses. Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission had been in place since the 20s. They had experience uh, post-war from 47 or 46 to 50 uh, managing uh, the request to um, create subdivisions, um, and WSSC had already put water lines in um, trunk lines in all the major stream valleys, and they could just extend water lines and, and sewage lines to development as it occurred. The war years and the Depression were pretty tough on, on farmers and, and um, dairy people in Montgomery County. Not all of them were able to sort of com compete at the, after the war ended. A lot of down county land was becoming available for sale. These people wanted to uh, make some money on their land. Uh, we had good roads, sewers, gas, electric. We had uh, a rapidly increasing population. We had federal agencies that were hiring in D.C., PG, and, and Montgomery County. We had new private companies coming to the county. Residents had good jobs and high incomes, and we had good schools and parks. This is all and um, what we all take for granted today. Good roads. Good roads meant there was good in and out, north-south access for people going to work or coming home. But University Boulevard was being expanded from College Park up towards Wheaton. Um, New Hampshire Avenue was being expanded. US 29 was being expanded. Veers Mill had been expanded to take into account the Veers Mill Village subdivision of the 40s. 
uh, you had the beltway. Here's the beginning of the beltway coming down. This is 240, it was called then, coming over to Pooks Hill. Um, so we had good roads. BC Transit was very responsive to new home building. And so if you, had a, if you lived up in um, uh, Wheaton Woods or Veers, or Veers Mill Village over here, you could take a bus uh, all the way down to a job in the district. Or someone in your family could take a bus all the way down to Silver Spring to shop or all the way down to Chevy Chase to shop. So if there's only one car in the family and someone was using that car, there still was a way to get to shopping and there was a way to get to work. Montgomery had, County had a lot of people. We grew a lot in the, in the 40s. We went from 80, almost 84,000 to 164,000 people in the 40s, not quite doubling our population. But we doubled it in the 50s. We added 107% growth. We had 300, almost 341,000 people by, uh, by uh, the end of the decade in 1960. And most of these people wanted shelter. They wanted a place to live, and they were coming here to uh, buy homes. We had uh, three categories. We had private, federal agencies that were hiring people. They had a brand new one, the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, we had private companies that IBM, um, John Hopkins, um, General Electric, uh, moving into Montgomery County because they wanted government contracts. And we had a lot of local businesses that were hiring people. So we had a strong um, employment uh, in environment. We had, a, by the end of the 60s, of the 50s, we had 135,000 people employed in the county. Uh, two thirds were men, one third were women. A little more than half worked out of the county a little less than half in the county. We were not a bedroom community per se in the sense that everybody was going down into DC to, have, to go to work. We had almost half the county was, was working in the, in the county. <clears throat> We'd already had weathered the controversy of, uh, of building homes for war veterans. These homes were lower, uh, had a lower price point and provided less amenities. <clears throat> this was a county that was used to having high, high end homes and all of a sudden, in, uh, a, a company out of uh, New York uh, came down and in one year built 1,105 homes on, off near Veersmore Road in 1947 and titled, it was oh, sorry, called Veersmore Village. The immediate age of the buyer was 21 years old, veterans, all veterans. Price was $8,500. You had a 30 foot front and 150 foot uh, uh, depth of the lot. Again, we talked about this earlier minimum, FHA minimum, to, to 624 square feet of space. Uh, you got a living room, you got these, these rooms, four rooms, plus a basement, unfinished basement. And the reaction from the Chamber of Commerce and from the county commissioners was, these are chicken coops. These are instant slums. These are going to be deteriorate and collapse in, um, in, in, in 10 years. They'll be, they'll be ruins, and we're going to have to pay for it. And they asked their, I think I spelt this wrong, two N's in Glenn, and they asked their congressman, J. Glenn Bell, to uh, investigate this. And he did. In April and May of 1948, they had the investigation of the Veers Mill Village Veterans Housing Project, Montgomery County. Um, and what came of it? They did find out that some of the uh, um, foundation, concrete foundations, were poorly poured or poorly mixed, uh, but the company fixed those. Um, they interviewed the residents, and they all said, hey, I'm not living in the city. I'm not living with my parents or my uncle. I've got a place to raise my kids. I've got, look at all these people, they all look like me. They're all, we were all raising kids in this big uh, development. Um, we're fine. So that was kind of the end of the concern about the veterans housing. Now let's talk about what happened in our county, the 50s boom. This is a, 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 a good map, at least good to me. We're gonna be talking about everything in yellow. These are the houses, this is where houses, housing was built in the county uh, between 1950 and 1955 and no one made a map that showed 1960s. This is good, as good as I can get. But you can see, this is approximately half of all the housing built in yellow, and you can see that it, 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 it's a significant amount. But the thing to realize is that D.C. and Montgomery County had a history of developing prior to that. So here's Chevy Chase and Bethesda, and here's uh, Tacoma Park and Silver Spring and, and Kensington and Rockville, they all built, they were all in development before 1915, so they were in place. Then the red is the expansion of the district, and then we have more ex growth outside Chevy Chase and towards Bethesda, and more growth in Silver Spring, a little bit in Rockville. Um, the dark brown is 25 to 40, we had more growth around those same areas. Not much in the, in the, in the 10 years of, the, of 1940 to 1950, most of it in the last five years, of the, 50, of the 40s, but then 
This is what we're going to talk about, everything in yellow. This line here, this is the Potomac area of the county. This is the line that demarcated the suburban district of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So that's not the whole county. Uh, Maryland National Capital was only responsible for the suburban district, and this is true when they went into PG. It wasn't until later in the 50s that they had responsibility for the whole county. <clears throat> so let's, and here's a chart that shows where all the houses were built. They were only built in four locations in the county. Rockville had 2,800 homes in 19, January 1, 1950. They added 5,300 homes. They went, they went boom. Rockville just exploded. Beers Millville, I mean, uh, Twin Brook Parkway was, uh, Twin Brook Development was part of that. They had 8,000 homes by uh, the end of the 50s. Uh, Colesville had 1,900 homes. They added almost 3,400 homes, and they were up to over 5,000. Bethesda had 12,000. They added nine, almost 10,000. They were at 20, almost 22. But here's the big, the big growth area for homes in the, in the 50s. Wheaton already had 23,000 homes at the beginning of the 50s. They added to almost the same amount, 22,000, in the 10 years of the 50s for a total of 45,000 homes uh, that, uh, in the Wheaton area. But more importantly, okay, this figure, 46,000, these are all the homes built since 1776 in Montgomery County till January 1, 1950. And here are the homes built from January 1, 1950 to January, to December 31st, 1959. I mean, we almost built as many homes in the county as they had had, had built over 100, 150 plus period of time. So um, everywhere you look, somebody was building a house. And that amount of house building influenced population density. So if we start with, again, with, uh, let's start over in Colesville, number five, no, number four, number four is Rockville. 1950, Rockville had 287 people per square mile. By 1960, it had 1,030 people per square mile. Let's go to Colesville. Colesville had 65 people per square mile in 1950, 85 by 1960. Let's go to Bethesda. They had 2,121 people per square mile in 1950, beginning of the decade, and they had almost 3,900 uh, by 1960. And then Wheaton, boy, we were packed in there. They had 2,059 people per square mile in 19, uh, beginning of the decade, and they had 4,300, more than 4,300 uh, um, at the end of the decade. So <clears throat> where you build houses changes the population density. Population density changes the allocation of location and distribution of income in the county. So here's the, it, as of the December, as of the 1960 census, Everything in light yellow, people were earning 12000 and over. Here's Potomac. Not a lot of population, but they're all making money. And here we are over here in um, uh, Silver Spring, um, Wheaton area, close towards Colesville. And then we're over here. Uh, this yellow is in Bethesda, Chevy Chase. Um, <clears throat> and even, the, even the, the bright yellows, which is the real, where the real money is, uh, the light yellows are in here in, in Chevy Chase and, and around here, none of that over in the Silver Spring area. The tans were eight to 9,000. The Siena, you know, here, here's where the money was. Here's where the houses were, here's where the people were, and here's where the higher incomes were. And, and that influenced house values. So here's a, this is kind of hard to look at, but here's the top of the District of Columbia. This is the mid 50s. Everything in red is the most expensive real estate in the, in, uh, in, in the county. Uh, Green is the next, yellow is the next most expensive real estate in the county. Uh, green is the next most expensive. Blue is the almost the least expensive, and brown is areas of uh, depressed housing prices in the county. Um, so you can see a distinction here. Draw a line right from the top of the district. More of the more more of the expensive housing was over in the Bethesda election district of the county. Uh, less of it was over in the uh, Wheaton and up in the, in the Rockville area. Uh, I mean, they, these weren't big differentiations, but the trend was there. That the wealth, more expensive houses were going to be in the Northwest and less expensive were going to be towards the Northeast. <clears throat> now, let's make something clear. The 1950s housing boom was for whites only, um, really with, really with no, no exceptions. The FHA was not looking, uh, did not want to be involved in inharmonious uh, uh, subdivisions and collections of uh, population. Um, <clears throat> so here's where the, the 
non-white population, as they call it in the 1960 census was. And see, and this is the large, this is 30% um, and over. So the green areas have the largest African-American populations in the county, and the white areas uh, have the least. And you can see that by 1960, the down county had become very homogeneous with uh, just some, uh, some areas that, with African-Americans, but those areas had been in place for, for, for years prior to that. And they had a different quality of housing. Uh, here, this, this property here was in operation until into the 1970s. <clears throat> and this, this property here uh, may still be in operation <clears throat> somewhere in the county. So there's huge, huge disconnect between uh, the, pro the housing for African-Americans and the housing for um, uh, whites. Here are the post-war housing styles. Now, there's four of them here, but the big one is Center Hall Colonial. Anybody live in a Center Hall Colonial? Okay. I mean, it's wa Washington, D.C. is Center Hall Colonial land. They love it. They got away from it in the 50s and the 60s, and they're back, they got back to it by the late, late 70s. They just can't stay away from that. Um, unpredictable, uh, always uh, valuable, um, no risk involved in design. But <clears throat> the 50s were a time where new things were coming out. So we had three, four categories. I gave them a, a sheet of paper, and I'm not going to spend time explaining them. I'm going to let you see them. Here's your Cape Cod style. This is Veers Mill Village. Um, uh, same thing, 420, oh, 624 square feet. Here you go. Um, but it, it also had the ability, see this window here? That this, if you pitched the roof high enough, you could have room for two more bedrooms and a bathroom. So it was a very useful house for families that expected to expand. Easy to buy, easy to expand. <clears throat> Then you had your ranch, rambler or ranch style, and I think those two words were interchangeable in the Washington area, although they may, they may not have been in other parts of the country. Now you had the ability to have more room, things more spread out. It's a longer, uh, linear, linear house, split level or split foyer. Um, the, the, what that was is you have a two-story main structure and then you have a one-story wing. You come in, here's your family uh, kitchen, dining room, uh, sleeping areas up here, rompus room here, and you have a garage. Um, it's just a different way of intentionally trying to arrange the space in the house for the activities that people would have in a home, keep them separate. Uh, then you have the contemporary style, which you could also call modern. Uh, these were the real risk takers. These were the people that just wanted to be different, and they wanted a house that looked different and was different, and there's many good examples in Montgomery County. <clears throat> so I'm going to... Take a drink of water here. I've moved pretty quickly through all that. Um, and you, I'm going to take a pause. Any questions about anything I've said, part one and part two? Yes. Um, I, have a, I have a question. So the Cape Cod house only had one bathroom? First floor had one bathroom. You could add one later. Yes, two questions. Hmm? Okay. Okay. I'm going to continue. All right, go ahead. Now what I'm going to do is go through some of the subdivisions that were built in the 50s, and you can see how these housing styles actually showed up in Montgomery County. Um, where I can, I'm going to try to talk about who built them, uh, because we didn't have big building, big, you know, out-of-state companies coming in here and building houses in Montgomery County. The, the fa firm that built um, Veers Mill Village was from New York. The firm that built Glenmont Village, Investors Diversified Services, had such a amorphous name, we're not even sure who they were. But the rest of the properties built in Montgomery County, the builders, you knew the builders, the builders had, had made a name for themselves, they were residents of the county for the most part, and I'm going to try to talk about where those people uh, built homes in the county. But <clears throat> the first subdivision I want to talk about is Glenmont Village. Um, here's um, Randolph Road, and here's Georgia Avenue. So you have Randolph Road coming from, what, Rockville over here, and here in the area called Glenmont. Uh, land was pretty cheap here, and uh, they built 650 Cape Cod-style houses. They advertised them as modern bungalows. Um, the housing pr house price was $95.75, $350 in closing costs, $65 a month. If you were a GI, you, could, you would put no money down. Um, 
and here's and and in their promotional brochure, they said not only are you getting not only are you getting the FHA minimum, uh, which was uh, two bedrooms, a living room, uh, a kitchen, uh, a bathroom, but the second floor has space for two more bedrooms and a full bath, and a full basement with concrete walls and concrete floor. And this is what some of these homes look like today. Here's uh, one with the entrance in the center, and here's a huge difference. Entrance on the right, you could probably have an entrance on the left. That was about your only choices. <laughs> then, um, if we, here's, the, here's a Georgia Avenue, um, and uh, here's the Beltway, not built yet, but right here is an area called Northmont. Anybody heard of Sam Ige? <clears throat> Sam Ige ran a, ran a grocery store in the district, then he ran a liquor store and business in the district, and then he got interested in real estate. And um, he did a lot of very, very important projects in Montgomery County. I just picked one of them, pretty small. He, he bought land up here, uh, called it Northmont, and uh, put in 59 Ramblers at $12,500. And uh, <clears throat> here's a Sam Ig Rambler, built in the 50s. Um, and here's, he already knew what was going to happen. Here's the Beltway. They haven't built it yet, but here's his subdivision right here. So I hope they build a wall, a sound barrier here, because these people... Close to the beltway. <clears throat> then there's Carl Freeman. Uh, anybody heard of Carl Freeman? Yeah. Uh, he, was a, he had a good sense of design. He wasn't trained as a designer. He had a good sense of house design. Uh, he was a home builder. He was an apartment builder. He was a great philanthropist. Um, he built a number of these subdivisions I mentioned here. But he, cre he brought something here called a California-style bungalow. That's what he called it. But it was a five-room house, had large windows, uh, radiant heat was coming from pipes embedded in the concrete slab. Um, it was new. This was not a traditional house. And uh, one of his subdivisions was the Alta Vista Terrace in the Bethesda area. He used a design firm, an um, architectural firm out of Alexandria. Uh, and he built 61 Ramblers in this, uh, this arrangement here. And you see, there's not really any cul-de-sacs here yet. We're not seeing any cul-de-sacs in, in these subdivisions yet. These are still sort of grid, but, but the roads are flowing like this. They're not quite grid, between grid-like and, uh, and cul-de-sac. And here's his bungalow. Um, you uh, enter here. You would uh, have a breakfast nook to the right, and then the, then the kitchen. And if you kept going, you'd be in the living room and dining room area in the back. Uh, there's uh, two, two bedrooms over here and a, and a third bedroom along the hallway uh, towards, uh, that faces the living room. Um, big, these ribbon windows, this ribbon of windows across the front brought a lot of light in. Uh, here's a, another of his homes, and this is, I just took this a couple days ago. These, they're holding up pretty well. Uh, people like them. But uh, Carl Freeman really was an apartment guy. <laughs> he wanted to build apartments. He was in the wrong county. Because they built all these homes in the late, late 40s, 46, 45 to 50. And all those people said, I don't want an apartment in my backyard. And, that's, and he had to sort of struggle with that. But he did build the Americana Flower Apartments in 1956 on Piney Branch Road and Arliss Road in Silver Spring. He used a company, Kronstadt and Collins Architects, and he used them over and over again. Um, he really wanted to build apartments that you wanted to live in. That felt like you were in the garden apartments. He was the first one who really sort of made it, uh, helped you understand the term garden apartments. And you can see, he has sort of a campus-like quality here. You had a big balcony, you could look out and, and uh, see what was going on and, and uh, be part of the natural environment. Um, he was a good apartment builder. Um, we also built other apartments in the 50s, but only about six different, maybe six total apartment complexes in the 50s in Montgomery County, hard to believe. One of them was Battery Gardens in, in uh, Bethesda with 62 units, um, and it's still there today. Um, I'm still sure it's uh, very expensive to live there. Uh, he built the Parkside Apartments. Uh, oh, he didn't, but uh, the Parkside Apartments were built in the Rockville District, um, and these are still here today, and they're, you know, these are really very attractive. And uh, Freeman came back and built Knob Hill Apartments, again on Piney Branch Road, um, and he worked very hard to create sort of a natural environment where you would be willing to let your kids go out and play in the, in the, in, in the yard in front of your apartment uh, and um, try to make it a positive environment. Now close to, um, in, down in Silver Spring, if you're following Route 10 out of Silver Spring, 
you get over into the Montgomery, um, Rosemary Hills area, uh, it's an area of single family homes, but also an area of apartments. And within, and the, about 500 Ramblers and contemporary homes were built there and 414 apartment units. Um, but in that neighborhood is a <clears throat> place called Richland Place, where they built 20 contemporary homes selling about, for a little bit less than 25,000. Uh, architect named Joseph Miller uh, designed the houses. He went on to be the dean of the Catholic University School of Pharmacy, I mean, School of Architecture. Um, and um, uh, his builder he, that he used on all of his projects was a guy named Bert Tracy. Here you see the contemporary or modern element. These homes sort of fit into the, into the landscape. They look like they're coming out of the ground and they belong there. And let's look at this brick one, because imagine if you went into this house and went to the backyard, here's what the backyards look like. He had a sloping terraced uh, property. And so on the back of all these houses, he built this recreation area, which was sheltered. Your parents and the kids could stay out of the rain or they could go out in the yard and play. He had unfinished basements, but still had this big glass wall. So they, one family put their bunk beds down there and this is where the kids lived. And they could, they could play in here and, and be sheltered from the rain or they could go outside and play in that yard. This was really a family oriented design. Um, anybody here of Joseph Gerhardt, Twinbrook and Twinbrook Forest? Uh, he was a Belgian immigrant, came here after World War II. And Twin, Twinbrook was on, here's, here's Beers Mill Road was on this side of Veers Mill and then over here as well and, and uh, Twinbrook Forest was over here right before you got to Rock Creek and uh, Park, Park Lawn Cemetery. So a lot of houses and he did a lot of things. He built 1,500 Cape Cod split levels and contemporaries. His Twinbrook Cape Cod, notice the steep roof, you could put a bedrooms up there, sold for $9,200 uh, in, in 1950. He went on and copied a design out of Levittown. He called it his Levittown Ranch. And now you're seeing kind of the triangular and geometric quality to the 50s homes. Place for the car, you know, got to put your car somewhere. Um, sold that for 11500 And this is uh, one of his homes today. Um, and it's a very attractive, very, clearly very modern. You look at it and you go, modern, 50s, 60s. Um, he also built a two-story um, house with a very unusual roof, sort of this short on this side, but slopes down the other. This was called his St. Regis model. And here he is looking at his plans and here he's building all these St. Regis models in Twin Group. So there's a lot of different varieties of homes to see in one subdivision area of, of Montgomery County. If you go to the Twin Book and Twin Group Forest area, you're gonna see a lot of different kinds of homes and get a sense of how well they worked for people. And this was a, a photo from the Washington Post. Uh, this is when they had an open house, people, it wasn't like the adults just showed up. They brought their kids. I mean, they didn't have babysitters. Um, uh, so they would, you would have kids running through these houses and kids on the lawn as, they, as, as the parents decided whether they wanted to buy a house. Charles Goodman was a, uh, it's called a modernist visionary architect. He did a lot of good work in Montgomery County. He built the old terminal at, at National Airport, the one they still retained for historic, it's beautiful. Um, but he w went on to uh, be very in influential in residential architecture, single family homes in, in, uh, in Montgomery County in Virginia. Along Veers Mill Road, he built uh, south of um, where Twinbrook was in Veers Mill Village. He built Hammond Hill in 1950, 20 homes, it's over $10,750. Here, this, look at this, this glass wall, floor to ceiling, two story. Uh, glass wall and a, a, a glass wall on the side of the house. They put the model up on a Friday and they sold all 20 of them by Sunday. So he moved across the street and bought land and started Hammond Woods in 1951. And he built a little bit of a bigger house, still on a concrete slab, no basement. Um, this is what it looked like then. This is uh, what it, one of them looks like now. Um, <clears throat> one of his characteristics was this big massive fireplace was an architectural element partly also was light. You, know, you couldn't tell whether you were. His idea was, are you inside or outside your house? It doesn't matter. You're gonna be, in, you're gonna be a part of nature. And you'll see these trees that are here. These houses were just built. He intentionally went in and only took down the trees where the house was gonna be placed so that people would immediately have a sense that they were living um, close to nature. Um, and this was a, 
a three bedroom house, um, one bath, and here's the, you, with, you enter here, uh, here's your fireplace, there's your living room. This is really eight, uh, you know, this is the d dining room area. Back here was the kitchen, bathroom, ba bedroom, bedroom, bedroom. Um, very popular. He also did a, a subdivision called Rock Creek Woods over in the Bethesda area. These sold from 2,200, 2,100, 2,200 to 25,000, uh, 22,000 to 25,000. Um, and this is a different design, bigger house, clearly a bigger house, two-story. Uh, still have all this uh, emphasis on light and, uh, and here with these windows open, also on ventilation because air conditioning was not a prerequisite in every house. Um, just as interesting to me as, as the house is a 1959 Rambler. I mean, 1960 looks just like I'm sorry, uh, maybe it was a 60. Uh, no, that's 59. Yeah, my parents had a Rambler station wagon, and I, I could barely get a date. I mean, that was just the worst thing. <clears throat> uh, over in Rockville, um, uh, Don Gingery and uh, Wes Buchanan built uh, Hunger for Town. They built 200 Cape Cods in split levels. Um, right on Rockville Pike, here's Richard Montgomery High School. Here's the old fairgrounds up here. Here's all this development on Veers Mill over here. There's been very little on the west side of, of Rockville Pike, and he was the first to get in there. And here's the Hungerford uh, development. Um, he had a problem, though. WSSC hadn't caught up to him. They, and so he didn't have any water and sewage. Um, he had to put in the water and sewer lines and run it to uh, the WSS nearest WSSC line uh, for the first 200 homes. And I'm sure that took a lot of his profit away. Um, but um, he did it, and uh, it was a successful community. And these are the kinds of homes he built. Here you have your, your split level, two-story uh, home with a wing. And then this is sort of a uh, twin brook. Um, I think this was a carport. See the difference in the brick? I think they bricked, the, bricked this in later. So this was the carport, and this was the original house. Very similar with these ribbon windows to uh, what you saw in twin brook. Interesting thing about Hungerford Town. The NAACP picked it to be a place where they would try to buy a home and have an uh, African-American family live, and they did that, and the family moved in. The community also had a pool, and um, the this notice came around, oh, no, we're not going to let these people use the pool, and it was circulated to all the residents. And all the residents said, yes, we are. This is our community. Everyone gets to use it. This is this. And so they just said, we're not going, if you don't, they don't go to the pool, we're not going to the pool. So uh, Hungerford Town basically uh, you know, decided that they wanted to be, an, they were an open community and they, and they acted on it. Uh, over in the Bethesda area, uh, anybody ever hear of the Cutlers? Yeah. <laughs> they built everything. Yeah. Um, but Clarence Cutler, um, Built High Point in 1955. He used an architectural firm, Patterson and Warland. Here's Clarence, good looking guy. Anybody know Clarence? Yeah, your dad, right? All oh, right, handsome guy, good guy. And he built a nice subdivision. Here's uh, Massachusetts Avenue. Um, right, here's Osceola. Uh, a lot of it was over here on Osceola. Here's the number of homes. And he built um, Ramblers, a price point of $20,000. And here are two examples of it. Here's, here's one of them. See the big picture window? And these windows are pretty wide in terms of letting light in. And then here's another one with a big picture window. The Ramblers had that mo could have a modern, modernist kind of a quality in terms of letting light in. But they were brick. So they, we're in Washington, D.C. We're, we're building brick houses. You know, they, he, was, he, was, he was hedging his bets in terms of what people would want uh, in the short term and the long term. And it's a very successful subdivision. Uh, anybody here over Kemp Mill Estates? Um, in 59, Jack Kay of Kay Construction and his partner George Greenberg uh, came out to, um, this is um, Kemp Mill Road. They came out to, and started Kemp Mill Estates. Um, I couldn't find this modern house in my searching in Kemp Mill, but I'm sure there are examples of it is there. Uh, but for the most part, here's what I found. I, uh, a sort of a, this is sort of a rambler, but it has a lower story uh, based on the, the terrain. And here's clearly a, a split level over in, in Kent Mill. If you go through Kent Mill today, it still is a very dynamic, operating, uh, 
well-maintained uh, neighborhood. So it was, these builders built communities. They didn't just build houses. They were interested in making sure that they worked in the long term uh, for residents in Montgomery County. <clears throat> Another guy named Alvin Abano built 300 Ramblers and split levels over in the Bethesda district. Uh, this is Fernwood. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, okay. Thank you. Old Georgetown. And uh, here's Wildwood Manor. And he built Ramblers. And this was his pride and joy. This was an Abano all but, uh, split level. And his, this was his forte. And he was uh, big, wide picture windows, bringing lots of light in. And um, he built as many of those as he could. Now, over in the Colesville area, the country, Potomac, now Potomac is the country, but back then, Colesville was the country that, uh, with some cachet, and um, a uh, developer had 105 custom-built lots, custom, lots for custom-built homes, multiple acres, five to 10 acres per lot, and here are two examples of the homes they built. Here's sort of a contemporary um, homes, but it, it, the property, I'm truncated it here, it goes way back, but here's clearly a really aggressive contemporary or modern home, all glass wall, um, very open, uh, very, almost in the, like a cabin in the woods, except uh, it's a big cabin, uh, very beautiful. And then finally, if you go over to the Glen Echo area, um, there's an area called Tulip Hill, and here's the subdivision, here's Goldsboro Road, um, and these are, I guess you could call them ranch or ramblers. Um, they're really big. We're talking 2,500 square feet. For the 50s, 2,500 square feet was huge. And they're well positioned, uh, lots, lots more land, um, high price to begin with, and continue to um, improve in value uh, and well maintained. <clears throat> but also, if you're driving down Tulip Hill, you might look up at a house like this. Here's the, uh, the parking area. And you can't see anything. You have no idea who lives in this house. You have no idea what they do. Because this is the 50s. We live in the backyard. This was a house designed by, De was it Degart, Degart and Yerkes? Yerkes. And the house, this is the front. We don't care about what you think about the front. We care about what happens in the back. And so he, ha he built this big, like a ship's prow wing. Um, and here are your bedrooms and study along this wing and your living areas on this wing. Plenty of room for the kids and the dogs uh, to play and uh, be, be part of the natural environment there. Um, <clears throat> and that was one of the orientations in the 50s. There was hiking, picnicking uh, was a big deal. The park system in Montgomery County uh, was uh, well utilized. People wanted to get out in nature. The idea of visiting national parks was a big thing. People were, wanted to be outdoors and closer to nature. And many of the homes built in the 50s tried to respond to that in terms of the piece of land you had where your house was built. Now, <clears throat> quickly, you build 42,000 homes in 10 years, you got to build schools. <laughs> so they built, Montgomery County built 50 elementary schools in the 50s. 50. They only had 30 to begin with before the 50s because they were trying to catch up to those babies born in 45. By 55, they were 10 years old. It's, they, you, they got to be in elementary school. So here's the over Weller Road Elementary. And, they, and the county placed them in suburban subdivisions, close to housing. Um, because elementary school, you want your kids, kids walk to school. They didn't take the bus. And um, they had to build a couple, four junior highs. And here's Eastern Junior High uh, in a subdivision. Here's North Bethesda Junior High, still in a subdivision. Again, because these are young teenagers. They, they're walking to school too. And we also had to build new high schools. Here's Sherwood High School, built in 1950, out there in, in the Colesville area. And here's Walter Johnson, built in 56. Um, and the difference in wealth is clear in terms of the parking lot. I think these are, look at this. These kids are bringing cars to school in the 50s. Pretty good. They had to build places for the families to recreate. And they built 29 community recreation centers. Here's the one they built in Aspen Hill to serve um, uh, that community, and here's one over in Cabin John, and they built 27 other ones. Had to build libraries. Until 1952, there were 11 libraries in Montgomery County. There was Silver Spring, there was uh, um, Bethesda, there was Tacoma Park. They were all in set like private homes, or they were in a, a, a hardware store. You could go in and get books, and they were informal. And the counties offered all of them, said, listen, we'll take over it, we'll fund it, if you'll um, 
uh, give us your inventory. So um, they built, they took over the construction of the Bethesda Library from the Bethesda Library Association and built that. Tacoma Park built its library in 1955 um, on its own, a uh, very modern building, still in use. This building is no longer in use. The Tacoma Park Library building is still in use. Uh, they built the Silver Spring Library in 57 and the Little Falls Library in 59. Um, and that was their way of responding <clears throat> to the need for uh, library services in, in these new subdivisions. There's a book for sale out in the lobby uh, by <coughs> Royce Hansen. Um, <coughs> Royce Hansen was the chair of the Montgomery County Planning Board um, from 72 to 82, uh, 10 years. But then he was called back in 2006 and served again uh, till 2010. Um, and he thinks the county is an ex excellent example of the speed and scale of post-war uh, suburban housing growth in the US. So if you study Montgomery County, you're sort of studying what was happening around the country. Um, and of course, he would say that, that it illustrates the role, primary role that land development played in the form, function, and demography of the modern suburb, uh, uh, because that was the, his whole job. But um, Montgomery County is sort of a living laboratory of post-war suburbanization, even, even, even well into the uh, 21st century, um, where things were as planned as well as they could be and executed well. Um, and thank you. That was a lot of slides, wasn't it? I apologize. I, could, I love them all, um, but I have to learn to get rid of some of them. Any questions? Right here in the front. I'm uh, Tanya Starr. I'm actually with the Montgomery County Planning Department. Oh. I'm the Deputy Director, so this is perfect <laughs> presentation for me. Um, I guess a couple of observations and a question. One observation is the map that you showed, um, or a couple of maps that you showed where the concentration of the um, more expensive housing as well as the higher household incomes you know, being concentrated in the western part of the county, down county. Right. I was struck by how some of those same patterns still exist today. Oh. So that's, that's one observation. And also, um, as you were showing all the different um, housing developments, a number of them, or maybe most of them, are along major corridors or near major corridors. And without kind of seeing all of them laid out on a map, um, a, I wanted to confirm that that was the case, but also how did um, a lot of those residents, you know, the, the public transit that was available or did exist at that time, were a lot of, I was just curious if a lot of those housing developments were also near, like bus routes and things of that nature where <coughs> most households probably only had one vehicle. Right, you did, I did show you the, the, the DC Transit. Yeah, you map. did show that um, one, yeah. So DC Transit was putting lines as quickly as they could uh, to new areas of housing. Um, but the, and I don't have the, the chart, but the reality is the automobile had already won the day. If you look at the 1960 census, they asked people how they got to work. <laughs> and they all got to work in a car. Now, now they may be in a carpool or their own car. Uh, they, and then bus and train was just so far down. So they weren't using the Metropolitan Branch of the BNR Railroad much to get to work. They were using their car or, or someone was picking them up um, or they were taking a bus to work. Um, but the car was clearly, it already emerged as the dominant uh, transportation for, mode for uh, county residents. Yes. So, um, this is great, really interesting. Um, you know, the houses were just all so ugly. <laughs> and, um, and I just wanted, if, is it just that our taste has changed or was it just strictly function over form and, and it had to just deal with the price points? But I just feel which, like- Which homes were ugly to you? All of them. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, they really, I just, do, do people really think that they were pretty? Or was it just didn't matter? It was oh no. Um, <clears throat> You, you can't buy a Charles Goodman home. <clears throat> and if you do, you're going to have to pay a premium for it. Those modern homes with the glass walls. No, that, those actually were The nice. people that love them, love them, love them, and love them. Um, you, the, Washington is an unusual housing environment. And, and there are, anybody involved in housing here in the, in, in the room? OK, I'm going to say something, and then I want you guys to tell the truth. My sense is Washington briefly flirted with new ideas of how to lay out how to arrange space in a house 
in the 50s and the 60s. And then they said, oh, the heck with it. We want to make sure that our houses sell and, and there's uniformity and we fit in and we're going to go back to sort of a traditional, more of a colonial, center hall colonial oriented format. And when we got into the McMansion phase, my sense is they really looked like colonials. They're just big. Somebody supersized them. So I just think it's a quality of the Washington area. But Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> right now, the houses where I'm, Tom Kenton, we're still building houses. If we, uh, the outsides of the new houses, and you, if you look at the teardowns in Bethesda, we're not doing any of them. But they're all craftsmen. They're all, yeah. you know, they have the square posts. So it's all going back. So right. now the inside's completely different. You don't see kitchens that are all, you know, everybody wants to dig over the kitchen. Right. So the interior, I would say, is much more modern, contemporary, but the exterior is still, I mean, a few people still dabble in, in contemporary, but it's pretty rare. But people, people <laughs> like that predictability of, right. you know, and they're, and they're harkening back to grandparents' house or mom, you know, whoever's, but that's, everything we're doing is stone, <coughs> craftsman, brick, you know, it's that look. Yes, Lawrence. Uh, more of a comment. I am age two to nine or so. I was in Twinbrook, and I thought it was perfectly normal to have a veneered plywood wall that wasn't painted in my bedroom. I had my own bedroom. And right. my parents were thrilled to have their own place. Right. You know, my father's a veteran, and, and to them it, it was fun. And if I can just offer two more recollections of it's a more innocent time. I walked to school. Right. One time the kids didn't come home on our block, and one mother found us boys Climbing the only tree left in the neighborhood that was still large enough, it had been farmland <laughs> to climb. She took to climbing. Right. She could turn climbing the tree. Right. Anyway, but I think that's a big issue for the 1950s. That some of these people were like still living with their parents or someone right after World War II because there weren't enough houses. So it was really. Yeah, the doubling up and tripling up of families. Uh, depression caused it. World War II, there was no housing. All the materials were supporting the war. People were doubled up. Uh, yeah. It impacted Tacoma Park significantly because these big houses were carved up into apartments and then once people moved on to other places, those houses were at risk. Uh, but, um, um, the, the, you know, this, the housing boom in the 50s answered a, a, a need. But these my, people my wanted... Point to, is they didn't, some of the homes were not, rather plain looking, right. but there was this pride of owners that finally got my own place to right. transition to. Right. Middle class life that we know today. Right. Uh, Our tastes have changed. I mean, you can't imagine that's living it, living it. in a 624 square foot house, didn't you? Know, with one one sharing one bathroom. I mean, people. I mean, you think that's a hardship? Uh, that's because we live here. This is, you know, we're just lucky. Yes. Um, the houses that you taught the media post war, um, a lot of years meal, and there was a congressional hearing about it. What was the quality? They were put off within days. Are, did, are they still in existence? You know, did oh yeah, all the houses in Deersville Village are still there, uh, although um, the Most front may look small, but they've blown out the back, or they may have blown out the sides. Yeah. The story, but they, put a, story. they put a second story on it, so it's no longer a, 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 a Cape Cod. It's now a two-story house. But they were adaptable, um, and they were inexpensive. Yes, Diana. I grew up in Michigan, outside Detroit, and the slideshow could be done in Michigan. Oh, good. I'm same ready. houses. That's same exactly what I wanted to hear. And it, it, it totally explains uh, the kind of neighborhood I grew up in, especially the cul de sac. I mean, a lot of these are cul de sac, but right. the, the whole idea of the um, you get in the middle. And it also explains why when I came here as an adult, and looked for a house and looked at houses at the freeway. I said, "This is my the neighborhood I grew up in. I don't want to. I don't want to be here again." Ah. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear you say though that the housing styles look similar to what you experienced in the Detroit suburbs because that's what I think it happened. This is totally. This is not unusual that these houses were being built, these variety of houses and these forms were being built in the 50s. This is what the country did. Ralph. Bob, I just want to mention one development you didn't mention, which is significant, Carter Rock Springs. Today, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Those are very modern. Right. Um, Late 60s. You're, you're, I'll write that, that you're exactly good. I, I omitted as many things as I included. Uh, it was hard to decide. Sometimes I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know enough. Uh, and uh, 
Another one that's not in here is uh, Kenwood Park, uh, which was significant historically because it was um, Kenwood. Kenwood uh, was a very exclusive community in the Bethesda area. Uh, you couldn't really get a house there. Um, and um, if, uh, it was Jew if, you if you were Jewish, it was hard to get in there. And Kenwood Park was kind of a development. Not restrictive. That's right. No covenants were allowed. Right. In Kenwood, Kenwood Park. Kenwood was. Uh, right. And, um, and so the, and all of them are modern, these low slung, beautiful houses. I drove through it the other day, and there's teardowns. And what are they putting up? Big, colonial oriented, taking the whole lot, square, the whole lot uh, houses. So it's not as if they're saying we're gonna, we're gonna fit in. It's really amazing. They're saying, why not build a big modern house two stories high? I'd go for that, but, but this, this, we've narrowed ourselves down to what's safe and what uh, will sell. And that's, so. Mel. I was gonna ask, I didn't see any row houses. Were any row houses built? We call them townhouses now, but years ago they were called row houses. Were any of those built during the 50s? Yeah, there was a development that built some duplexes. Um, I just didn't include it because there were so few of them. There were, you know, just two houses and two houses and two houses, but I, very few. There were a lot in the 40s, I think, uh, certainly in the district. In the district? Not in Montgomery County. In the 70s. Yeah, not in Montgomery County. Leland. Yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, before the war, two-story houses were built uh, that really couldn't accommodate central air conditioning when that came into being. I mean, the ductwork was such. You know, with the second floor, you couldn't get sufficient cool air during the summer. Uh, during the 50s boom, uh, did the builders build their houses if they were two-story houses so as to accommodate central air conditioning. Tom, yeah, I, was, I grew up in Tulip Hill in 1955. Oh, you did? Our house did not have an air, air conditioner. Did not have air conditioner. Okay. Yeah, it was not. Yeah, it was two-story. <coughs> and attic fan. Yeah, attic fan. Yeah, big, fan. huge fan in the ceiling of your second floor. And you turn the switch on, sound like an airplane take off. <laughs> Suck air up and throw it out through the attic. Throw it out through the attic, right. There was a lot of that. Yeah. Um, lady there? Yes. Can I ask, um, I live in a post World War I <laughs> development of uh -huh. Battery Park in Bethesda. Yes. And my neighbors say that the original houses were financed by a type of GI Bill. So in terms of the history of the FHA project, I mean FHA project, <clears throat> can you tell me anything about the relation, historical relationship between what happened after World War I for veterans and what happened after World War II? Um, I have no, I have yeah. absolutely no information uh, about that. It's a curious okay. question. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, sir. What's the rate of development in Montgomery County today? <laughs> Tom? There's not much like, you know, Clarksburg, I mean, that's... that's I just gave you that thing that uh, And then, of course, you see redevelopment in, 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 down, in down county areas where, you know, houses are 50 and 60 years old. Um, and there's that issue of, you know, re, you know, tear down and rebuilds. But in terms of new construction, there's, you know, up in Clarksburg, there's really not much left, really. So if I could, if I could just add to that, the, uh, the planning department actually just this week released a report, a trends report, uh, looking at the um, trends in what has happened. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in a county since 1990, between 1990 and 2016, in terms of our population, population demographics, the housing, as well as employment. So there's actually a lot of data in that report to, to answer that question. Um, and I think, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but um, I, from what I recall, the, probably the majority of the new construction of housing units has been in multifamily, right. or has been single family housing construction, but definitely not as much as anywhere. Yeah, we've got pipe and rows and these, yeah. these sort of urban, you know, retail mixed use things developing right. around. Right. You know, and helps. And also, as you mentioned, a lot of one-to-one -one replacement of teardowns in these small halls with these larger, these larger homes. The, this article from your group says that the housing construction in Montgomery County has lagged behind the other counties in the region. Uh, 
they're probably building at the rate of 50% and ours is 32%, it says here. So the growth rate is, is lagging. The incomes are flat in Montgomery County. Um, and um, so we're more diverse. Our incomes are have pretty much flat, flattened out and uh, we're not building houses as fast as some uh, other jurisdictions. But we don't know what the meaning of that is. You know, it's, a, it's a blip in time, so um, I'm not sure it's just significant yet. Any other questions? Yes? Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Um, I was wondering um, if in the 50s the builders started to, or the developers started to hire more architects. It seemed like maybe 50-50, and maybe that was an um, impact on the designs. That was an earlier question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make one, one comment. I just moved here from Chicago right. in the last couple of weeks. I grew up here. Clarence Kettler was my uncle. And um, I just sold my house in Chicago, which has a nine month um, usual selling time for a home. But my house sold in about three weeks because it was a mid-century modern, which isn't a very hot product for the millennials. So luckily, I had a That's interesting. house. Um, yeah. if, if they could get, if the mid if the millennials could get salary increases that allow them to buy a house at the price point in Washington, they would buy and, and maintain and improve all these modern, all these modern homes. We're, salaries are lagging behind housing purchase prices, and that's a that has to be there has to be something that makes that adjust. Um, but your point about there was a yeah I forgot to mention there was a unique builder architect collaboration in the fifties. Uh, builders were. Um, they wanted to have interesting homes. They wanted to try new ideas. They, these modern ideas about um, ranch houses or California uh, ranches or, or ramblers or split levels or contemporary. They wanted to try to rearrange the space in the houses, mostly to support raising a family. The kitchens were completely changed. They tried to have uh, big windows where uh, the sinks and the, and the stove were and the washing machine so that, so that the, the caretaker of the children could be looking out the window while they're doing work um, rather than being in a, in a box, a closed room where they can't see what's going on. So there was a real effort to try to make the house serve uh, the, uh, the homemaker. Um, then they also were trying out new ideas. But I mean, I tried to indicate the builders that used an architect and that it, they were not afraid of using architects. They wanted to use architects um, because it was an adventurous, the 50s are so, so boring, right? Not really, people were adventurous. They just fought a war. They, these were young people who thought they could do anything. And they were willing to try new ideas. And, and, and the 50s really in architecture in the 60s is a time of great innovation. And we've, we've retrenched. We uh, are not exploring um, how to use space and houses the same way we did in the 50s. Yes, sir, Tom. Builders were trying new ideas and contracts. You think that that time back in the 40s might have been focus groups? Or did they just do what they thought would really be a knockout, a beautiful design? That's a good question. I have not, like a charrette or whatever that, I have not seen any indication that they collected consumers to figure out what designs would work. Uh, but Carl M. Freeman's work was just about the same everywhere. Yes. With, uh, with flower apartments and a lot of other apartments in the area. Well, he did Americana, he, he did Americana Glenmont. He did Americana, did he do Finmark? Uh, Finmark. Yeah, I mean, he did, he did a lot of uh, really beautiful garden apartments. Um, and, but I think a lot of the ideas were also coming from the West, from California, where there's different kinds of housing styles. We had all these GIs on the West Coast. They saw things, and they had professions before they were in uniform, and they brought those observations back and to the East, I think. Yes, sir, in the back. Danny. Danny. What about Utopia houses? Why didn't Frank Lloyd Wright make Utopia houses here since Frank Lloyd Wright was so popular in the 50s? I mean, everybody loved Falling Water and couldn't touch Nob. That's way I'm going to let our resident architect answer that question. Um, some of what you're seeing in these sort of contemporary ranch things were <laughs> builders and architects trying to interpret some of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture but not quite so on the edge of what he did. There were areas, um, I happened to grow up in suburban New York City, 
And there was actually a place called Usonia, which was the Usonian houses, and there's actually two Frank Lloyd Wright houses in it. But it had, it had to be designed, it had to have a certain amount of greenery, they were limited on how much lawn they could put in, and it was all that Usonian look. Even there, that was, that was an extreme, mostly what was still being built was sort of a more conservative interpretation of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, you showed Springbrook Forest there. I did a project there, and I always describe it as it was a house that was taking Frank Lloyd Wright with the big overhangs and the long roof, and it was really terrific, and it was, had lots of land and could look at the trees, except they hit the front of the house. They cut off all the overhangs and put little trim, and I said it was sort of like they got all the way through the design and went, oh my god, we're in Washington. It's got to be colonial. <laughs> <laughs> it says 11.52 on the clock on the wall. Um, we were supposed to break it at 11.45. Yes, sir, one more question. If you want to see a Frank Lloyd Wright type um, develop and come to Garrett Park, um, and we have Richterville. And Richter was a cycle of, of Frank Lloyd Wright. He built, built several houses on Oxford Street, Weymouth, and Claremont. And so we have some Frank Lloyd Wright development here. We have a Frank Lloyd Wright house in my neighborhood. Yeah, actually. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.